Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Susan DeMuth and I am the Executive Director of Alumni Relations here at Johns Hopkins University. This weekend is a very special time for us on the Homewood campus as we celebrate alumni returning home. It's a time for renewing friendships, catching up with uh, favorite professors, learning about Hopkins, how Hopkins has changed both within the classroom and throughout the campus. And last but not least, watching the Big Ten lacrosse game tomorrow when the Blue Jays beat Ohio State in the warmth of the sun. <laughs> so for those of you returning to reunion this weekend, whether it be your fifth reunion or your 65th reunion, we're so thrilled to have you. Welcome home. I would be remiss if I didn't welcome all of the alumni, friends, faculty, parents who are watching us online here today as we are in the Great Hall in Levering Hall. In just a moment, we'll hear more about some of the exciting initiatives here at Johns Hopkins, especially the Hopkins retrospective. And of course, no one knows the many exciting initiatives and projects happening on the campus and throughout the university than, better than our president, President Ronald J. Daniels. In 2009, President Daniels became the 14th president of Johns Hopkins, which is of course America's first research university. Since taking office, he has focused his leadership on three overarching themes, enhanced interdisciplinary collaboration, individual excellence, and community engagement. These themes are the backbone of the university's strategic vision through 2020 and underscore the priorities of John, Johns Hopkins' largest ever fundraising campaign, a $5 billion effort. During President Daniels' tenure, the university has launched a series of multidisciplinary initiatives aimed at addressing some of society's most vexing issues, bolstered the efforts for faculty, staff, and students to translate discoveries into novel technologies, invested heavily in student access, and extended its rich community partnerships. A law and economics professor, scholar, excuse me, President Daniels is author or editor of seven books and dozens of scholarly articles before, become, before coming to Johns Hopkins. He was provost and professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania and dean and James M. Torrey professor of law of the faculty of law at the University of Toronto. Please join me in welcoming President Daniels. Thanks, Susan. Well, good afternoon. It's uh, great to have you all here and to uh, be able to welcome you to this wonderful celebration uh, as part of our Hopkins Retrospective Initiative. Uh, we often say that there's no better way to kick off a Hopkins homecoming weekend than to have an academic lecture. This is a university that really knows how to party. So um, I'm glad you're here and embodying the best of Johns Hopkins. Um, when we launched this project uh, to explore a collective history, I recall thinking, and in fact confiding to a colleague, that my office truly echoed. And um, it wasn't a sound issue, of course, but rather in so much of what I have done in the seven years that I've been here, there are these moments when there's a decision being made, a conversation you're having, a challenge you're facing, and that you can hear the echoes of the past in that conversation, in that moment. And um, for uh, me, uh, this, uh, this particular sense of the past, its echoes, its ability to shape and frame our understanding of our present was very present uh, for me um, a few months ago when we, uh, like other uh, universities across the country, had a moment of protest on our campuses. And you'll know that we had, um, in uh, the fall of this year, following um, events on a number of campuses across the United States, we had a moment where the Black Students' Union organized a protest uh, to express concerns about certain aspects of life at Johns Hopkins and worried about diversity, 
and the university's commitment to it as exemplified by the kind of hiring we do, uh, the kind of climate that we've created and uh, so forth and program support on a whole range of different issues. And of course there are parts of this that are distinct to Johns Hopkins, but you know, this is something that resonated uh, throughout campuses in the United States and I think really represents a moment in which uh, the um, students and the agenda was and continues to be framed by a broader set of issues and anxieties about uh, diversity, racial equality in the United States. So it was in that moment where what happened was is that uh, the students, um, the students uh, staged a protest in Kaiser Quad and they knew that I was gonna be at the quad at a certain time for, uh, we were doing filming for our holiday video. And so they knew I was gonna be there and so they staged the protest at that point. And so uh, they, uh, they were, um, they were um, uh, chanting and expressing concern about the state of the climate at the university. And I had never been to a protest before, so I'm trying to figure out, you know, they know their role, I'm trying to figure out my role. And, you know, and so I went up to the students and I just listened to, uh, to them. And then after some back, basically they had, uh, they were chanting a bullhorn and then they stopped and basically read a set of demands. And, um, and I, uh, I wasn't sure if I was gonna speak at that point, but in any event, I uh, waited, uh, they chanted a little bit more, and then I said, look, they gave me an opportunity to talk, and I said, um, you know, uh, this, is, this is a conversation that you're starting here today, and in fact, it wasn't really on that day, but it's an important conversation, and let's, let's meet um, to, you know, to talk about the demands and the issues that are being raised, and uh, let's do that at, an, um, at you know in a in a time and a place of your choosing. But let's do it quickly. Anyhow, long story short, we ended up meeting uh, right after Thanksgiving. We resumed and we had a two three hour session that was very well attended. Uh, some alumni, in fact, that are in this room uh, were in attendance, but it was principally a student event. And this was the interesting moment, as I I, I was expected uh, to in some sense frame the university's response to these issues. And uh, in doing so, I thought it was really important to go back and understand the formation of the Black Students' Union, the history of protest and, at the university, what were the issues in play, and just get some kind of context for this moment that we were in together. And this was for me, and I talked to Bill Leslie, and I said, Bill, give me everything you've got on the history of protest, particularly around issues of race um, on the campus, but make me smarter so I can at least understand this moment. And it was so important that I did that because as I sat down with the student demands and started to think about what I was gonna say at this event, and I started to map out all the things I was gonna say, what was clear is that I came upon a set of materials that went back about 20 years ago to uh, one one of my predecessors was president, confronted with a similar moment, a similar agenda, and I realized what I put down on paper was exactly what he had said 20 years earlier and yet, if you look at the progress we had made, it was by no means exemplary. And so all of a sudden, you know, this moment, and I remember talking to Bill and saying, you know, how, how do we understand this? How do we frame it differently? How do we react differently? But the past was very much with us. And I say this because it really underscores this point that no institution is a blank slate. You know, there are decisions, there are histories, there are personalities that very much shape where you are today. And so for me, um, this was one more instance when I really had a sense of this deep craving for a deeper sense of the history of Johns Hopkins so that we could be better in doing the role, in discharging the role that we have today. Um, this was very much why we implored, entreated, bribed, cajoled uh, Bill Leslie uh, to take on the task of writing a history of the university. Um, and uh, this is something that uh, we feel very excited about, that Bill has basically agreed 
to take several years to write the comprehensive history of Johns Hopkins. Now, it's not going to be, it's, you know, I'm sure there'll be other, he will always say, there'll be other histories that are written, moments in history that will be tackled in greater depth. But what we really wanted to have was one volume that pulled together the long arc of our history. Because right now, it's covered parts of our history, the formation of the university, a few decades afterwards it's covered very deeply, then there's another book that it covers a bit of the history, and then there's periods of time when there's no history, and then it gets picked up again, and a variety of different sources, but we wanted the history all in one place. And at the same time that we started thinking about what Bill could do in writing the history of the university, uh, we thought that we should locate this in a broader effort to um, elevate the uh, task of uh, mapping out the history of the university. And so this is where we came to the idea of the Hopkins retrospective. And uh, led by uh, Jenny Kinniff, uh, we now have an oral history project that includes interviews with former faculty and alumni capturing their experiences uh, here at Hopkins. And we're doing a lot of work in, in essentially getting input feedback um, and we've got student groups that are working with this. I'm sure uh, Bill will say more about that. But um, this, is, uh, this is something that is, I think, going to be a very important um, moment in the, uh, in the life of the university. So uh, with that, I want to uh, turn this over to Bill, who is just perfectly suited to uh, do this history. Uh, he was my first choice in terms of finding a scholar of impeccable stature uh, who could tackle the task of writing this, uh, this, this history and to be part of the project, of the, of the retrospective project. Uh, which I said has a number of related activities other than simply writing the history. And I'm um, excited that he's here to talk to you today. The, our, what happens with Bill is we get, this is a very exciting moment for me because I get sort of new stories, new perspectives on our history that, he is, uh, that he's been working on over, over the year since the last time we had alumni at the university. Sadly today, I've got two other events to go to, so I'm gonna have to watch the uh, recorded session uh, to get up to speed on what's happening, but I'm um, really grateful he's here. Before I turn it over to him, I should just uh, say that um, we're really pleased that uh, Dr. Bob uh, Hieronymus, uh, uh, that his great mural has been restored and, uh, and that mural of the apocalypse is again another important element of our history and really appreciative of the Marha family, uh, several of whom are here today for their vision and support in helping us restore Bob's stunning work. It's again, it's wonderful to be able to unearth uh, these parts of our history and to celebrate them appropriately. So with that, uh, Bill, uh, I turn this over to you and thank you again for leading this uh, initiative. Great. Thank you. I'll see you on stage. Thank you, President Daniels. Was there ever a protest at Hopkins that started on time? <laughs> no, <laughs> of course not. But I would like to thank a few people uh, from the Hopkins retrospective, uh, program manager Jenny Kniff, who, who isn't here today, uh, Catherine Arner, our, our postdoc, Jim Stimpert, our archivist, who knows where all the bodies are buried and also managed to bring an actual protest banner with us, which we'll unveil at the right moment. You may remember it. Uh, Ellen Rogers Fett, who was a fantastic undergraduate researcher and did a lot of work for this particular talk. And then uh, Jordan Steele, our Hudson curator, who is going to make sure that the WICWAR papers get back to our special collections. They're now at the University of Baltimore, but uh, he promises they'll be back where they belong. And thanks also to to Dr. Bob uh, Hieronymus, who you'll be hearing from shortly, and I had the pleasure of really getting to know him over the summer as they were uh, restoring that mural. And to have me comment on the mural would be a little like having you know, Pope Julius II or, or, or the papal historian give a tour of the Sistine Chapel while Michelangelo was standing there. So that there's, no, there's no reason on earth for me to talk about the mural. Bob will, will do that. But he did give me a box of wonderful uh, booklets about the mural. The unfortunate thing for him is that he left his car keys. 
in the box. And I thought, I've got it. The key to the Woodstock box, the bus that he painted. And it doesn't seem to be here, so I'm going to give it back. But at, at least, you know, <laughs> I tried. Thank you. And I also wanted to thank Bob's many assistant artists who worked on the mural. And I, I saw at least a couple here. If they're there, stand up. If you're, anyone's here, because they, there are oh, those, yeah. They not only did a great job, they gave me a memento. They all signed this paint can, which now sits proudly in my office. So I'm, I'm very pleased with that. OK. Now, protest at Johns Hopkins sounds like an oxymoron, right? What did Hopkins students ever protest about? Closing the hut too early? Too much noise on D-level? Great inflation? Well, believe it or not, for, for you youngsters, there were older generations of Hopkins students who actually took to the streets for fair housing, for civil rights, uh, against the Vietnam War, of course, uh, against classified research, whether on campus or at the Applied Physics Lab, for more inclusion and diversity on this campus. Some of them built shanties to protest our investment in South African companies doing business in apartheid South Africa. They built shanties and occupied, I'm glad the president left, but he'll see this. Uh, they occupied Garland Hall for a couple of weeks on two occasions. So that there actually is quite a history of, of protest at Hopkins. But there is also a history of civic engagement, of people who became tutors or political activists or community organizers. Now, you've undoubtedly heard the quip, you know, if you remember the 60s, you weren't really there. And you probably all think that, well, Robin Williams said it. Well, I tried to track down who did say it. Uh, no, it wasn't Dr. Bob. <laughs> Maybe he said it. But it was such a perfect 60s picture, I couldn't resist. Uh, it turns out that a lot of people seem to have said it, uh, including one member of the Jefferson Airplane, who's pictured here, and a number of other people. And Timothy Leary, of course, is my favorite. How would he remember what any, what had been said in the 60s? Who knows? But if you, so maybe no one re really remembers the 60s at all. But if you were there, and here, I was there but not here, you were many of you there and, and here, you will remember Levering Hall as one of the epicenters for protest at Hopkins. Many of the big events happened right outside this door. And you will also remember this fellow, Chester Wickwire, chaplain. Uh, th th this is the best I could find for a, a, a 60s version of him. He, he always has the, the great sideburns. But an indefatigable activist on behalf of civil rights, social justice, engagement with the city, all of the things that President Daniels just talked about, Wickwire was doing from the time he arrived in 1953 until beyond his retirement in 1984. He lived into his 90s, and he was still stopping by at protests uh, in, in, his, his late, in his late 80s. Now, the invitation to this program said business attire. And so I followed that, but as a mild protest underneath this, I have a tie-dyed Johns Hopkins lacrosse shirt of the right vintage, which when we tour the mural, I will take off the shirt and join the movement. All right. There's Dr. Bob again. Here's my favorite uh, archival find about protest at Hopkins. Disgusted nerds hold pitiful excuse for riot, <laughs> which, which, you know, seems kind of unfair. Uh, now, now, to be honest, in 1962, a Hopkins riot really meant pouring out of the AMRs and onto Charles Street and just making trouble for trouble's sake. But it was a, it was a, great, uh, a great quote. And even you know, the idea that Hopkins is an apathetic campus goes all the way back to almost our founding. This is the original Levering Hall downtown, way before Wickwire's time. And we had a journalist who visited us at the early part of the 20th century and left a record of what was Hopkins like at the time. And I'll just quote a little bit from it. He said, and you'll of course agree with this, the chief student activity is study. And the only time the university officers have to exercise their authority is in driving the students out of the laboratory at night. But then he went on to say, and you'll also relate to this, he said, there's no dormitory or clubhouse to serve as the center of collegiate society. They have a gymnasium and a YMCA building, but their principal resort is a dingy barbershop basement 
And their chief pastime, according to my observation, is pitching dimes in the alley, which is a nice way of saying gambling. The only student publication is the newsletter, a magazine of uncertain character and time of appearance. Well, you can judge for yourself how much has changed between 1910 and now. Uh, we have a better gymnasium. The newsletter does appear more regularly. We certainly have nice dormitories. The YMCA building, in which we're sitting, is no longer affiliated with the Y, but we, we, we still have it. On the other hand, we're still waiting for that student union. But as I understand it, it's going to appear very soon. <laughs> but it's been going to appear very soon for generations. So I don't know how, how long that's going to be. We're still waiting. So when that article appeared, and we were still in, in Levering downtown, uh, the students actually wrote to that magazine to protest what they thought was an unfair characterization of Hopkins. And they said, there's a lot of things going on here. How about the fraternities? Said we, uh, where, where men do something else besides pitching dimes. Of course, they didn't say what that something else was. And then they suggested that what the journalist had missed when he visited all the other Ivy League schools is that they were gambling too. It's just that they were hiding, as he said, uh, hidden from his searching gaze by the walls of palatial dorms and pompous club rooms. We don't have any of those, so we were just out in the open. All right, so given that apparent apathy, when would you guess that the first strike anti-war strike and anti-ROT strike was at Johns Hopkins. Do not judge from this sign, which is obviously from a later period. You might guess 1965. How about 1934? 1934, there was a massive strike. In fact, in 34, 5, 6, 7, 8, there were massive student strikes against war on the Homewood campus. We don't have any good pictures of them, but we have some great descriptions. And you wonder, well, what war were they protesting? They were protesting, of course, war in general, and protesting a ROTC. And they gathered at Levering and in front of Gilman Hall to denounce the whole idea of war and, and the military and, and ROTC. And they heard speeches by prominent Hopkins uh, faculty. And they even recruited members for what they called the South Sea Island Battalion which was going to be an alternate to ROTC. And the idea was better to sit on the beach for the next war than sit in the trenches. They got a lot of members to, to recruit. The, the, the most interesting of parts of that demonstration, one will, will shock you, the other will amuse you. The shocking part is in 1938, there was a swastika mounted on Gilman Hall. And as part of the protest, students from the other side pulled that down. There was also a, a Soviet banner on Gilman, which was allowed to stay up. In the Hopkins tradition, plenty of students protested against the protesters. There were firecrackers thrown. There were eggs and tomatoes, et cetera. The only thing they could agree on is when the University of Maryland sent up a representative to call us un-American, they turned the fire hose on him and drove him off the steps of Gilman. So we could all agree we don't like the University of Maryland, if nothing, if nothing else. OK. Uh, this is the original YMCA building. Behind it is McCoy Hall. Uh, it's one of those interesting cases where you wonder why we would have a YMCA. Well, we have it because Eugene Levering, who was a noted prohibitionist, gave us the money to build the building. And as you'll see, it was a serious place. No alcohol allowed, good reading material, not the kind of place that, of course, would inspire uh, any, kind of, any kind of protest. One of the interesting features is when we got more money, much more money from a guy named McCoy, they, they figured, well, what are we going to do? We'll have to jack up Levering turn it, and then drop the much more expensive McCoy Hall next to it. So if somebody gives us a lot of money, we might jack up this place, move it, and plop down some tower or other. Uh, so when we moved from the old campus to the new one, one of the buildings was going to be, not in the original plan, but in the, in the 20s, was going to be Levering Hall. The reason we got the money for it was the old one conveniently burned down, and we got the insurance money. No, no clue on who burned it down, but we got the insurance money Another gift from Eugene Levering, and a very large gift from the YMCA in Baltimore. And so that money plus the university's money went into this building. So it's a little unusual to have a building in the middle of our campus, which of course is not really owned by us. Uh, this is when it opens, it's about 1929. And you'll notice that it looks a lot like Homewood House, and that was deliberate. The idea was to give it a central location. But having the YMCA pay for it meant that they appointed the executive secretary, and they did the programming. 
And there was a lot of controversy over what the Y wanted to do and what the university wanted to do, and, and a lot of complaints. There's a, a very interesting letter in 1937 from Isaiah Bowman, and he'd heard that black and white students were meeting together in Levering. These would be people from off campus at that point. And he actually insisted that any future invitations be routed through his office because he didn't believe in any kind of integration of the, of the campus. So that's a, a, a rather surprising thing, 1937. You also had uh, William Foxwell Albright, who was a famous biblical scholar and himself a, a devout Christian, but thought the YMCA too radical for his taste. And I found a great letter. He says, I'm, I'm thoroughly worried of the one-sided propaganda, the naive sentimentality, the philosophical illiteracy, the theological nihilism displayed by a majority of the speakers at the YMCA. Well, transport that into the 1960s, and that's exactly what Chester Wickwire was getting complaints about, that it was far too liberal a place uh, to be at the center of Hopkins. Uh, you can see, originally, we were a pretty serious place with discussions. What I like is to see how students dressed in those days. The idea that you'd relax in a coat and tie at, at Levering Hall is kind of an interesting one. So Wickwire arrives here in 1953. It's right in the middle of the whole Owen Lattimore case. There's a, McCarthy has accused him of being you know, the, the worst spy in America, of supplying students to the State Department who are undermining our policies, et cetera. So he arrives at the, at the worst possible time. And one thing he does is invite Lattimore to speak in Levering Hall on freedom of academic freedom of speech. And he's vetoed by the administration. So they won't let Lattimore actually speak about the issue of free speech in, in Levering Hall. So there he is. And what he does is make Levering a kind of bully pit, a bully pulpit for social issues. And remember, this is a, a, a campus that's still segregated. It's a city that's still Jim Crow when he arrives. And so he becomes really the conscience of the university and somebody very strongly committed to civil rights, not just on the campus, but in, in Baltimore uh, as a whole. And he does that in a variety of ways. He was very interested, as many uh, liberal theologians were at that time, in jazz and theology, knew a lot of jazz musicians, and invited, this is Duke Ellington from about that era, people like Duke Ellington to come to perform either in Baltimore or on the campus, and then to meet student groups in, in Levering afterwards. Uh, Nina Simone, 1961, comes here. And always they would give a concert, often in Shriver, but then they would meet with students informally here or upstairs in what was called the room at the top, or for, for if you got here later, it'd be called Chester's Place. And so that was an important part of his initiative, was to bring African-American performers here and get to, know, to get to know the students. And the list is really a who's who at the time. Uh, Charlie Mingus was in that, Odetta Holmes, a uh, number of people. Um, it, uh, you know, I've got a list of about <laughs> almost everybody who was anybody in jazz came, who came through Baltimore uh, per performed. Uh, and what's interesting is when Duke Ellington came in 1960, they decided to take him for coffee at the Blue Jay, which you may remember on St. Paul Street. They refused to serve him. It led to a student sit-in. It also was really bad karma, I guess, because two nights later the place burned down. No, again, we don't know why. We really don't know why. But he rebuilt it as staunchly segregationist as before. But those kind of experiences got Hopkins students thinking about ways that they could actually get out in the, into the community as civil rights activists, and, and many of them did. Uh, Ravi Shankar was invited here before anybody had heard of him or the Beatles. 1961, he, he appears and plays uh, at Shriver Hall and, and performs a little bit upstairs. Joan Baez comes here in 1962. You know, what is it that all these people have in common is that they are themselves activists as well as musicians. And so Joan Baez actually lives in Levering for about a week. She tours Baltimore. She talks to student groups. She even cuts a, a little album. And, and this is before she's really famous. She, she would appear on the cover of Time magazine. And this shot, you'll notice, from the 1963 March in Washington where she performed. But Wickwire's list, of course, was intended to demonstrate his social commitments as well as bring new artists to, to campus. 
This is a shot. There aren't a whole lot of them of Chester's place of, of people performing. Uh, you can see it was you know, not, not really well decorated or anything. Uh, but it certainly allowed for a lot of free expression because you could write on the walls. And if you could see it better, you could see all kinds of interesting political graffiti here that students left uh, in, in the 1960s. Now, Wickwire could be particularly provocative uh, in his choice of invited speakers. Uh, and Baird Rustin is the one here, who's one of the key organizers of the famous 1963 march uh, in, in Washington. And of course, for, for jobs and freedom, he knew Martin Luther King very well. Wickwire invited King here on a couple of occasions. But Rustin was a much more controversial choice because of his, his own history, his radical political uh, alignments. And in fact, when he visited, the Ku Klux Klan burned a cross on this campus and picketed the Hopkins Faculty Club. And the fact that he was not only African American but openly gay made this a doubly courageous invitation on Wickwire's part. And he never backed down from it and, and went through that, through that picket line. Now, you didn't have to pass any correct political correctness test to get an invitation from Wickwire. And I'll show you a couple of, of liar-hearted ones. Uh, Jane Mansfield was also brought into Levering Hall for a cerebral palsy uh, fundraiser. There she is in the newsletter, which, you know, no surprise, turned out to be immensely popular with, with the undergraduates. It was billed as a political event, a tea party. You get a tea party like American Independence, and she'd be there, and you could have tea with, with, with Jane Mansfield. Uh, another one who came, you may remember if you were there, uh, Hugh Hefner was invited by Wickwire to come and speak about the Playboy lifestyle. Now, what surprises you here is there were protests, but it was not women protesting the speech. It was held in Shriver. It was Hopkins undergraduate men carrying signs which said, send the, East, send the bunnies back to Easter and hemlock for philosopher Hugh and so on. So there, there were male undergraduates protesting Hugh Hefner's uh, appearance on the Hopkins campus, which is a little bit surprising. I do want to point out that Wickwire himself was very much of a civil rights activist on the lines. When uh, Gwinnell Park, which was a segregated amusement park, the northwest of the city, on July 4th, 1963, Wickwire and a number of clergymen went there, were arrested. I don't have a shot of Wickwire himself, unfortunately, but he was actually arrested. So was James Coleman in our social relations Department. And it was, in fact, desegregated uh, later in, in, in that year. So Wickwire was willing to put himself up to be, uh, to be arrested when, when necessary. He also was willing to directly speak to our president, Milton Eisenhower, about what was called the dual housing list. The university used to have two housing lists, one for landlords who would rent to African Americans and one who would not. And Wickwire thought this was an outrage. Eisenhower himself not for reasons of racism, but because he didn't think he should tell landlords who they should or shouldn't rent to, resisted that. Wickwar said, if you do resist, I'm going to go to the newspapers, and it's going to be a big story. And so Eisenhower did, did relent. He inspired, that is Wickwar and his civil actions, inspired Hopkins students to actually take upon themselves sit-ins. One of the famous ones was at a barber shop in the Marylander, it was in the basement of the Marylander. And we had, a, not many, but we did have African-American students. One went over there, was dismissed, really, with a racist insult that he wouldn't cut his hair. He came back. A group of Hopkins students, black and white, went, negotiated with the owner, sit-ins, negotiating with Wickwire. Um, and he finally agreed that he would, in fact, go to take special training so that he could cut African-American hair properly. He did that and opened the barbershop. But what's interesting is Levering had always had a barbershop open to black and white students. So that, too, was part of the, the legacy here. To reach out to the greater Baltimore community, uh, he set up a tutorial program. And that you're probably familiar with in 1958. This is not it. This is an earlier version of a demonstration school uh, from the early 50s. You can see they're thinking about going into space. But you also notice that all the school kids in that demonstration school are white. Wickwire thought, no, we have to reach beyond into the Baltimore community. And this is, I wish I had a better version of the sign. 
but he set up the tutorial program beginning in 1958, not just for school kids. He was looking to, to tutor high school students, but he also sent Hopkins students to work in, with prisoners, to work in mental health facilities, uh, to work in community uh, centers, to get students out into Baltimore to see what was actually there. He even sent them to the school for boys, the juvenile delinquent facility. The problem, of course, is he discovered that enthusiasm and idealism are no substitute for training and experience. So he had to refocus the tutorial project. Bring, at first, he would send people into people's homes and tutor the students there, or Dunbar. Dunbar High School is one of the, the important centers. It turned out that it was easy, easier and probably better to focus on reading and mathematics at an elementary school level and to bring the students here. The school system in Baltimore was not always supportive, but William Donald Schaefer was, and he paid for transportation so the students could come here. They would come uh, Tuesday, Thursday. There were also weekend and, and evening sessions. And this turned out to be one of Wickwire's uh, really great ideas. He taught a course called The Disadvantaged Child in an Urban Setting so that he could teach the tutors exactly how they were going to teach students. It's not an easy thing to teach third graders. I've, I've done it myself. After the riots in 1968, he thought Hopkins just had to respond in more ways than we'd, we'd done. We were simply an isolated, still largely segregated community. One of the things he wanted to do was have an open university so that anyone in Baltimore could be taking classes here on any number of subjects. And this is one of the, the photos. You'll see Wickwire back here. And I'm not sure who painted the Volkswagen. Probably not Bob. Did you actually? You know, is that you? I'm in there, too. I, that's what I, I saw it, and I thought, I bet that's Dr. Bob. All right, there's your handiwork. And the idea here, of course, was let's, let's start offering things that are relevant, not just to college undergraduates, but to people throughout the city. And I love the, the uh, for $5, you could take any of these courses. I pulled up, you can't see it from where you are, but the list of courses is great. Women's Lib, The Urban Crisis, Who Gives a Damn and How to Reach Them. <laughs> I like that one. And who do we sign up as? Professor Wild Bill Haggy, <laughs> if you remember him from the Orioles. <laughs> and he gave a course on how to watch a baseball game. And it was actually a number of, it was not just one class. It was how to sneak beer into Memorial Stadium, <laughs> how to drink it without missing the game, and when to take a restroom break. And in his chorus lecture, he says, whenever Mark Ballinger is batting, Mark Ballinger, because he you know, never hits anyway, so <laughs> but quite interesting. He also, of course, remember, Wickwire is himself a divinity student from Yale, ordained minister. He would have the Sunday experience, here he is, but not a traditional religious service, much more focused on civil rights issues, community issues, and getting students off campus and working in, in Baltimore. He did all kinds of interesting programs. Here's, th these are from slides, so they're not as good as I'd like, but this is the office staff uh, in Levering Hall at the time. But he had film series, three at a time going. This one happens to be about women, and our, but there were also classic films, and there were comedy films. And there's a great letter I found in the archives from John Waters, who's writing from LA. And he says, I've got this great new film, and I'd really like to premiere it at, at Hopkins. This wasn't Pink Flamingos. It was the one after, Female Trouble. And he says, I know I have a bad boy reputation at Johns Hopkins, but maybe you can set me up and try. They, they thought about it, but he premiered it at the Maryland State Penitentiary instead. And it really, our, our hip index took a real hit when he did that. Uh, but, but you can see that, you know, the, the Bijou Film Festival, he was always doing something to engage students. And like his choice of musical performers, wanted to make sure that they represented a broad diversity of opinion, politics, usually with a bit of a, a liberal slant. Um, farm workers, Cesar Chavez came here. Wickwire organized a protest against buying non-union picked uh, grapes and, and uh, lettuce for the, for the cafeteria downstairs. He held a rock concert one time on the steps of Gilman Hall. It disturbed the neighbors. Um, there's a great line from the dean. He says, uh, he, he tells Wickwire, you know, stop the unauthorized rock concert held by your office on Easter night on the steps of Gilman Hall. 
Students in the libraries, the dormitories, and apartment houses were unable to study. How terrible. Um, interesting, one of our alums who was living in Remington and was working with the Remington Community Association to try to get better relations between the university and Remington wrote a very strong letter of support to our president saying, you don't understand, this was not only a fundraiser for an important halfway house in Remington, it was one of the few times when young people from Remington felt comfortable coming onto the campus of Homewood. And you should really applaud Wickwire for this, not, not condemn him. He summarized his, his work perfectly in a little, he liked to write poems, this isn't really a poem, but he says, where can you go for a Wednesday night coffee house, tutor a child, take a $5 course, explore pertinent social issues, re-examine your values, see a dollar movie, study religion, get married, or buried. I don't know how many people he actually buried, <laughs> but he did marry quite a few. OK. Uh, this is Word Rock. You'll re recognize Dick Maxey, a young version of Dick Maxey. This was written, actually, by Wickwire. It, it combined the voices of James Baldwin and a number of other, Martin Luther King uh, Jr. and a lot of other activists of the time into a story about the generation gap. Uh, and he performed it. Wickwire is there. I had a jacket like that, but I, I couldn't find it. Um, I only could find the lacrosse tie-dye. But he was. Wickwire was very interested, of course, in the anti-war movement. He attended, this is outside City Hall, obviously. He would bring students to anti-war rallies in, in, in Baltimore and, of course, here too. I was a little surprised. This is the, one of the uh, strikes, student strikes in front of, of Homewood House. The war was, of course, important to Hopkins undergraduates, and especially in 69 and 70. I'll show you a couple pictures. But what really got their attention was the infamous narcotics raid on the AMRs. And what happened was Baltimore police broke into the AMRs and actually broke down the doors of two students, arrested them for marijuana and amphetamine possession, and then brought them out to the squad car. But the students in the AMRs, who very much objected to their sanctuary being invaded by the police, swarmed around the cars and refused to let them leave. The Baltimore police called in reinforcements. They tear gassed the students and, and, and made off. Now, then they marched over to the president's house, where Lincoln Gordon was, and tried to build a bonfire in front of it until he finally came out and agreed that he would give a talk to the entire community. 1,300 people showed up to hear him talk about why we should allow campus poli or police onto, onto our campus. In fairness to Lincoln Gordon, he did make bail for the students, so they didn't have to spend the night in, in lockup. But, but that attracted quite a bit of attention, surprisingly. But so did the war, and especially in, in, in 1969, in May. Uh, these, because they're cataloged by students, they aren't always the date they say they are. And if you, uh, if you look at this carefully, you realize it's not the right date. But you'll, it, it, it gets across the point which is that Students for Democratic Society had a small chapter here beginning in the mid-60s. They protested investment in South Africa in 1965, which is quite early. And they were important in getting students involved in these demonstrations, in, particularly in taking over uh, Homewood House. Now, a lot of faculty weren't that keen about it. There, there was one of them wrote a letter to the president. It was two hours of dreadful old left rhetoric, dress, uh, logic dressed out in equally dreadful new left rhetoric. But what it did do is it brought Lincoln Gordon back from a meeting to meet with the students. I, I, I couldn't resist this shot because you think, what a perfect Hopkins protest. They've got a Corvette sitting in front of the, but it was against the war, of course, not materialism. Uh, they, they occupied Homewood House, met with the president who took them over to Levering. And that's one of the points here is that Levering was always one of the main gathering spots. Uh, you can see the, the, the posters there. A lot of back and forth at the microphone between the president and the students. Uh, should we go back? Are we going to continue to occupy Homewood House? Demonstrations here were always very polite. They would wait until the, the secretaries left at 5, and then they'd ask to occupy the building. Uh, but in this case, when Gordon announced that he would, he would meet with them to talk about their demands to eliminate ROTC, which was the main one in military recruiting, the students did leave Homewood House with the clenched fists, et cetera, and then, and then met with him uh, later. Of course, compared with other places like Cornell in 1969, where the Afro-American Student, Afro Student Association actually took over Willard Strait Hall, uh, you know, 
guns raised, Hopkins was fairly peaceful. But it was images like this, of course, that had administrators here on edge and worried about, I, I like this one because it's welcome parents. Um, <laughs> that didn't mean we didn't have protests, but they never threatened really to turn violent. Uh, they were always, but, uh, but they, they, they made their, their point. It is true that homecoming that year, Baltimore police surrounded the field after the Navy game because they were afraid of protest. And that led, in turn, to protests from alumni who said that the administration was overreacting to the, to the students. And it was, it was sort of interesting uh, what they had to say. This is from the class of 1929. So it was their 50th, uh, 40th reunion. So they were like class of, yeah. Um, so he writes, this is a physician, and he says he, he wants to applaud the current students, this is 69, for overcoming the general political and social apathy which I, looking back, felt had been characteristic in my day. I realize they'd make trouble for you and others, but better some of that than the picture of indifference I'd gotten before. And this, this is the part that'll get you. I don't know how many of our class I had to remind that 11 of us, I was one, went to jail in our sophomore year over a silly banquet riot in Annapolis. And that like most of Baltimore, drank aggressively to protest the 18th Amendment. And that our sophomore banquet, again, remember this is, he's writing about 1929, was held at a roadhouse with a sex, surface, sex circus, an optional at extra charge visit to the girls upstairs. Today's students are generally in trouble over things that matter. And that was a very sincere letter, and there were lots like them where at least today's students at Hopkins are protesting things that really matter, not simply causing trouble in the neighborhood. Uh, there were certainly, this is from the next year. Uh, you'll notice here it says on Barton. Barton was in that time a classified facility, had guards at the doors, it was doing classified research. Students were protesting that. They protested, of course, the APL, which does a lot of classified research, even though it's not on, on this campus. Again, there were sit-ins, demonstrations, uh, a large march uh, on the lower quad, and a referendum where students and faculty actually voted on whether we should have ROTC on campus or not. It was a very close ballot. It was 1182 to 1121. To, and of course, the problem was it was kind of hollow victory because no recruiters were actually going to show up after that. But, but at least they got their, their, their point across. Not every protest. You'll recognize Levi Watkins, of course, who just died this year here. And you'll recognize Desmond Tutu. And Wickwire was very much involved also, although he had retired by the time of the anti-apartheid um, protests here, was involved in this too. This was a major one. And maybe some of you were here during 1986. There were shanties that were built out in front of Shriver Hall. Uh, of course, the, the students making their demands known. Muller, you remember, had been at Cornell during that time in 1969. Um, DeVest now, a couple, couple of these were built. In classic Hopkins tradition, of course, conservative opponents put up their own. Um, reform, not revolution, they wanted to make, they, they, they thought it was better that the university invest in companies that were in South Africa because they could work from, from inside. Uh, I don't like their shanty as much. Doesn't show as much hard work. Um, if you remember the denouement of the story, three fraternity brothers threw gasoline on one of those shanties, lit it on fire. Three students were actually inside. One of them was burned. What you may not remember is that the person who prosecuted the students for arson, Kurt Schmoke, who would be elected mayor uh, that, that, that fall. Um, Wickwire did organize events for, for women's rights, not, not as many, as, at least judging from the archive, as I might have expected, but, but they were certainly there. Uh, you can see him in the faculty club here in a, in a, in a, grainy, uh, in, in a grainy photo. He, he was somebody who, even in 84, after he retired, made sure that he attended uh, these events. He was there for the, the coalition um, for Free South Africa. That event, by the way, had been inspired by, by Desmond Tutu's visit in January of, of 1986. It extended all the way into 87. Uh, several times there were shanties built, torn down, rebuilt. Uh, there was an occupation of Garland Hall, which was called Mandela Hall, and was, it was a, about a two-week uh, sit-in there. And it was, it was quite, quite a major event and, and showed that students had not lost, uh, had not lost their taste for, 
for activism. And so well into his 80s, you could find Chester Wickwire on the barricades, whether it was for anti-apartheid or whether it was for a living wage. Uh, that was one where students organized, uh, they built the shanty on the beach. Again, it was one of these take it down or, or else. They got Wickwire to actually take their list of demands over to Garland Hall to deliver to the administration. But when they opened the door, the students rushed it. They occupied Garland for 14 days. They chained themselves with bicycle uh, locks to, to, to Garland. It was a peaceful demonstration, and eventually they took off the bike locks and they, and they stayed. The administration held fairly firm, uh, but eventually the, 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 the students were successful in, in, in getting divestment. I would like to tell you, here's Wickwire um, in, in retirement, um, that he had done more with, say, the Black Student Union, with women's groups and others on campus. One man could only do, any, could only do so much. I didn't see that much in, in, the, in the archives, uh, but he was certainly sympathetic to those causes, and he was the one person in, at the university, and maybe in all of Baltimore, that the Black Panthers felt comfortable in agreeing to surrender to Baltimore police in 1970 if he would accompany them. It didn't actually happen, but he, the, the offer, offer was, was actually made. So, I, I want to remind you that not, not everything that was about social activism was about Wickwire. There were plenty of other people on this campus who were socially committed. This is one we forget. This is James Coleman uh, in 3505, where I used to have my office. He was the one who wrote the famous Coleman report, which led to the school desegregation decision. Very important in, in his own way in, in, in civil rights. Um, it's the 50th anniversary this, this year of the of the Coleman Report, very controversial when it came out, uh, still controversial now, although for some, some different uh, reasons. So I hope in, in presenting this, this slice of, of Hopkins history, there's this Chester Wickwire, um, that I've captured at least the, spirit, the essence of the spirit of activism and protest that's been part of a vibrant intellectual life here uh, since the beginning of the university. A short talk can't do justice to every cause that was championed on campus. Even Chet Wickwire, they called him Jet, Chet the Jet. And he was a polio victim who got around on crutches. So somebody like that, with the kind of energy and enthusiasm he had, was, was quite remarkable. But even he had to pick his, his battles. Um, I've only given you a few examples. I can give you, give you more. But I hope the ones I have shared remind you of your time here and the many issues of society and politics that you may have first seriously considered as a student inexorably, of course, advancing toward the responsibilities and privileges of adulthood. And if anything, the challenges faced by Baltimore now are even greater than they were in Wickwire's day, and I think he would have been the first to have encouraged Hopkins students to embrace those challenges and for the university to live up to what he saw as its responsibilities to the city. He firmly believed that students, faculty, administrators, we should feel uncomfortable. It wasn't bad to feel uncomfortable. It was good to feel uncomfortable because it might make you go out and do something about the lives of other people. In 35 years of teaching at this university, I don't think I've ever had a more difficult time trying to conclude a lecture as I have with this one. And I think it's because the lessons of our history in this case are neither simple nor uncontroversial in the context of the issues we're facing now. As historians, we look to the past for instruction, and we look to the future as fertile ground for applying those lessons. But it is in the present that the work must be done. And that's the difficult part. Those at the university who do not shy away from protest and demands for improvement, like Wickwire, they shared with progressives of an earlier generation the belief that history is a rising road, an optimism that improvement in the lot of every member of society was possible and desirable. Nowadays, the Chester Wickwire Award honors an undergraduate who promotes multicultural harmony on the Homewood campus. But I think it's perhaps time for another award that is someone committed to those same goals in Baltimore as a whole, which is something Wickwire was very much committed to. We honor Wickwire and all he stood for, and for all those who protested then and, and now. And I think we honor them when we resolve to listen and learn from all those who dare us to become a better university better city, and a better world. Thank you. Now I'm going to turn over the floor to Dr. Bob, who's going to 
share some recollections with uh, Chester Wickwire, and then we'll lead you on a tour of the actual mural itself. Thank you. Wow, thank you, Bill. And before I say anything more, I want to thank you so very much for your ongoing support of this mural. I also want to thank President Daniels and all of Johns Hopkins for organizing and helping fund the restoration of the Apocalypse mural. Thank you to the Joseph and Harvey Meyerhoff family and, fa and the family charitable funds, and especially to my beloved Dr. Zahara Hieronymus for paying for it. That makes a difference, doesn't it? Many are here today, other people, and many of my friends are here today that I've seen a number of times. And also, sorry about thank yous, but I think it's absolutely necessary. This was not easy to accomplish such a thing. You know that? Uh, also, thank you to Ann Koch, Jane Reiner, Jackie O'Regan, and all my many superior maintenance people at Hopkins. Boy, you've got some great maintenance people here. I know you probably didn't think about that, but it's true, you do. We work with a lot of them. And a special thank you to our Hieronymus & Company executive producer, Laura Cortner. She is the world champion multitasker and master of the hardest, and also the hardest worker on our team. That's not an exaggeration. All right, now. A few memories about Chester Wickwire, the apocalypse and me. Before painting the apocalypse mural Johns Hopkins, I showed a couple of exhibits of my artwork in Levering Hall's Sherwood Room. Do any of you guys remember that back in the old days? Yes, there were the Sherwood Rooms over there. I, I remember it. And uh, I had warned Chester, Chester Wickwire, whom I knew as Chet, that some of these works might upset the students. You don't want to upset any of the students. And their families as well. But he said he was pleased that maybe they'd learn something. He, we never did have any problems with the students who were quite enthusiastic with what was shown. And most of the faculty were OK, too. But there was one group called the Faculty Wives. And they were ready to string me up. <laughs> what disturbed them the most were these large constructions that I created that Chester thought was great fun. Well, one was a 12-foot long coffin containing an American eagle dressed in a general's uniform bearing a crucified Jesus on its chest. On top of that was a crucifix with Mickey Mouse riding it, <laughs> along with corporate symbols, our favorites, General Electric, Coca-Cola, Chiquita Banana, and slogans like, Make Sales Sizzle. It was called the American Express, and Chet completely got it. Right, John? Remember that? He got it. Now, the wives of the faculty did not get it. They wanted so badly to shut down the exhibit, they brought in the Maryland Attorney General's office, who was just chomping at the bit to attack this uh, exhibit that they heard and he heard was un-American. They came charging in to bust this young artist with his long hair and scraggly beard, who they thought they were going to teach a thing or two about respecting our flag, our military, and our constitution. You know, I was used to this kind of misunderstanding and that kind of attack, but I was worried for Dr. Wickwire and figured he would probably, Bill, listen to this, fold under the pressure. <laughs> I, I couldn't have been more wrong, really. He, Chet stood right up for me, and he defended my rights as an artist on free speech and all that. But more importantly, he took the time to explain what my message was in this work. 
it was my sincere belief that America was for sale. Actually, in fact, I thought it had already sold out. I have this great quote from him when he said, Hieronymus, or quote, quote, Hieronymus is not attempting to be irreverent. He feels that America, not himself, has desecrated these symbols, end quote. Now, this allowed me the time to explain how our symbols had been desecrated. You know, you need to talk about those kind of things. And to share a little of the farewell speech of President Dwight D. Eisenhower, who, uh, whose brother was at president of Johns Hopkins at this time, uh, I think you all know the one I'm talking about where he says, quote, in the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether salt or unsalt, by the military industrial complex. Which of course today should be something more like the military industrial media complex, because they've joined the club. Now all this controversy only pleased Chet the further because as he said, it was livening things up, and that's what he wanted to do. The Attorney General felt satisfied enough that the matter was dropped, and the exhibit remained open from that moment forward, and I knew that I had to find a way to thank this very advanced, courageous, outspoken soul. He deeply impressed me. It wasn't long after this that Dr. Wickwire asked me if I wanted to paint a mural on the wall outside of his office on the second floor of Levering Hall, and the room was known as Chester's Place, a sort of coffee shop with the students hanging out there. Now, I really was honored at that request, but I had to postpone the commission at first because I had plans to meet with some record companies to design their record album covers in early July, and that was 1968. But, well, I did get a chance to spend some time with Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, The Doors, but it didn't take long to realize that the rock and roll life was not for me. How in the hell are you gonna do painting when you got a bunch of noisy musicians around, huh? So I returned to Baltimore to take up Chester's pr proposal. Chet showed me the wall, and the YMCA gave me a check for 1,000 bucks. And I began work on what I called today the American Eagle Wall. As it progressed, I looked at all the other blank walls and up at the ceiling, and eventually I asked Chester if I could expand beyond that one wall. I was so surprised that he said yes. I, I, I never expected that. I really didn't. Uh, well, he said, yes, that I could keep paying, but nothing more could be added to the budget. So in effect, I painted the entire 2,700 square foot mural for a, a thousand bucks, <laughs> which is about one eighth or one tenth of what the guys that I paid to work on it with me up there a little while ago. Now, I was fully committed to this painting. I literally moved into Lever Levering Hall I brought a sleeping bag, and for about six months, my entire life was, was spent painting, eating, and sleeping. Dr. Wickwire had no problem with my living there, but after the first few months, he did start to ask me, quote, when are you going to be done, Hieronymus? <laughs> End quote. Amazingly, that was his only, only complaint throughout the entire six months of working on this. Now, others in the building were not so happy that I had moved in. One particular overnight custodian in particular took it upon himself to try to get me kicked out. We first ran into each other one morning in the wee hours, uh, somewhere between 2 and 3 a.m., when I heard someone downstairs, and it, of course, at first, I thought it might be a ghost or it may be an alien. Well, it was only this fellow emptying cans and cleaning up, and he, as I said, he was none too happy that I was invading his space, and he started to check up on me every now and then, coming upstairs to see what I was doing. Then one day, he brought a Hopkins policeman with him and claimed 
I had a gun, and I had threatened to kill him. I thought he was joking, but he wasn't. He was serious, and he pointed to the so-called gun in my pocket. This turned out to be my tobacco pipe that I occasionally smoked from. Then he accused me of hiding my revolver. So I told the officer, and sometimes I don't suggest you do this. So I told the officer to search me and all my bags so I could get back to work. He searched everything, found nothing, and he apologized. And after he left, even though I felt, I felt like I was in the twilight zone. You know, someone's charging you of, of attempting to murder him. Well, unfortunately, I thought it was all over, but it wasn't. A couple of weeks later, he returns. The same employee came upstairs and renewed his claim that I was out to get him. Once again, the same policeman came, but this time when I told him he could search me again for this mysterious gun, and, but he refused. He just refused and left apologetically. Now, somehow, this story got to Chet, and he thought it was hilarious. <laughs> it became a running joke for him to ask me for my gun. <laughs> yeah. He seemed to especially like to do this when some of his friends were around. His eyes would light up, and he held back a little smile, and I just knew he was enjoying himself teasing me this way. Where's the revolver, Hieronymus? <laughs> well, over the years, I've been honored to receive some pretty nice praise for the apocalypse, and I want to read to you this one because it was one critic's remarks that Chester really liked. Art critic and now world-renowned artist, uh, Liz Whitney Quisgard stated, quote, if Renaissance Catholicism gave us the Sistine Chapel, well, actually the ceiling, 20th century Protestantism has given us ceiling, three walls, and a stairwell, and it's called the Apocalypse and will be seen but not quite believed in Levering Hall on the Hopkins campus from now until Armageddon. <laughs> he really liked that quote. Besides the gun, he liked that too. Obviously, as a symbolic painter, my work pales in comparison to Michelangelo's, but in fact, there are a few parallels that uh, Dr. Wickwire and others pointed out to me. For example, we both had paint thrown on our paintings by fundamentalist critics. Our sponsor's lack of cash plagued us both, <laughs> and we both had a, a deal, a terrible deal of all this falling paint in our eyes and ears and hair. It was terrible. And, of course, I think Michelangelo, yes, I know Michelangelo, probably also heard, when will you be finished? <laughs> now, I think he was also believed, I know he believed in cycles, and especially cycles that deal with the main theme upstairs. Now, in closing, <clears throat> I will read you, uh, to you a dedication that I wrote in 1968 that was printed in the very first Apocalypse Mural Guide. And now we have a new one. This 72-pager explains everything in the mural because there's been enormous amounts of speculation in it, and we made, wanted to make sure that we got this right. So I said, this mural is dedicated to a man of compassion, of peace, and understanding. He is forever under savage attack for his benevolence towards the young. He is a bridge for all generations. He is a centarian or a Sagittarian. His name is Reverend Dr. Wickwire. Thank you. Um, are we going upstairs? Is that our next step?
Yeah, so we actually have about five minutes for questions. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. So if, if, you, if you all have questions for either of our speakers, um, because we're recording the event, if you could speak into the microphone, my colleague Jackie's over here if you're on that side and want to ask a question. So any questions for either of our speakers? We've got one back here. Dr. Bob, how many hours a day did you paint? The question was, how many hours did you paint? I'm sorry. Uh, forever. Uh, we were sneaking upstairs and you wake up. And can you, can you, okay, would you mind speaking into the microphone? You're right. Okay. Remember, I was living here. So I woke up and the first thing I had to have is about 32 ounces of coffee. Uh, how much do we work? I worked, I worked till I dropped. It was at least 12, 16 sometimes even longer than that. So it was pretty kind of like my life. But most artists do that, you know. Most artists like to have, take the time to be deeply involved in their work. So that seems like a long time, but how else could it get done in six months? I was only one person. The team that I had who did a splendid job, I mean, they did extraordinary. Will you guys stand up again? Where are you? Really, these guys. Yeah. We, we started out with four artists, and we thought we were going to get it done, but as you would read in this book, of what happened, we had a lot more to do than we ever thought. We had to give it three coats of paint. We had to hire up to eight people, and that's how we got it done on the very last day, August the 20th. And we're very proud of that because we didn't want to hold anybody back because the children were coming in soon, right? Thanks. Other questions? If you were going to try to start doing it now, oh. but had other people to help you, is there anything you would do differently for what you've displayed there? That would be a nightmare. I mean, uh, there's a lot of things I would be doing differently. First, I would have raised double the amount of money Yes, yeah, double. No, no well, oh, no, no, I meant, no, these, we had a budget that ended up, it cost us $70,000 for what you see up there now. 70 grand. And the artists all got paid $20 an hour. And the thing was, I did not want them to be in the same spot that I was in. And I wanted to make sure that, you know, and we went out a number of times and partied and ate as much as you possibly could. I noticed that they did. They ate as, <laughs> they're good eaters and, uh, and good drinkers and polite to be with. Uh, but I would hire the same team and I'd pay them double because it's horrendous doing the same thing three times especially a ceiling, it will, the neck problems, we, we had to hire, where is the guy we hired, John, Jonathan, stand up, see this guy here, it was very late when we started to realize we weren't going to make it, they didn't think, they thought we were going to make it, but I was looking at it, and I, and I said, we're not going to make this, we're going to miss this by a day or two, so we had to go hire one artist to put him in this terrible situation of looking up all the time because all of the artists took a, a, a break at it. I mean, they, they all worked with it. There wasn't any complaints. This was the best team of artists I'd ever worked with. And when you look at their, 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 being, their education and uh, uh, the quality of their own personal work, you realize that if they hadn't been so well trained, we wouldn't have made it. Because anyone that has to go over something three times gets so bored that they will get sloppy. And that's something you can't do. And this is very simplistic art up here. And, and if you get sloppy with that, it becomes very obvious and gets kind of messy. So we got time for one more question. Not a question, but an observation for Bill. I remember in 19... 50, give or take a year, in the evening we had a, a uh, protest in front of Gilman Hall 
for McCarthy's attack on Owen Lattimore of what was then the Walter Hines Page School of International Relations. Yeah, the, no one can cover all of them, but the, it was very interesting how that divided this campus and how many critics of Lattimore there were. He was acquitted, of course, but we never, we put him on administrative leave, essentially, and then he eventually went to uh, England, but it was a loss of a great back. Hmm. The protest was in favor of him. Yes, yeah, no, that's right, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the reception is happening just next door, uh, so we invite you over there, and the tours of the mural will begin shortly thereafter. So thank you to... Uh, thank you. You're very welcome. Yeah.